Ladies and gentlemen, it's Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. here in lovely Perth, and that means it must be the ICRA Astro 3D Weekly Astro Talk. Hooray! First things first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're speaking, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, who are we? We are both ICRA, the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, discovering the hidden universe through radio astronomy. And we are also part of Astro 3D, the ARC Center of Excellence in All Sky Astrophysics, unifying over 200 world leading astronomers to understand the evolution of matter, light, elements from the Big Bang to the present day. So, you know, just little things that we're trying to study. And joining us tonight, if our expert, to tell us about all things about simulations is Dr. Lillian Garrett Smithson. Hello, Dr. Lillian. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> so, what do you actually study? Well, so um, I mainly um, conduct simulations. So, I link um, models of the universe and simulations to um, uh, big surveys like the um, SKA, so big radio surveys, and I um, so my PhD was on modeling um, um, the places where stars are born, molecular clouds, and now I'm looking kind of more on galaxy scales and maybe even sort of regions of the universe, modeling them, seeing what we, um, you know, how our galaxies evolved and why the universe looks the way it does today. That sounds super, super, super cool. <laughs> Now, before we do that, though, we have our very special segment, Science or Art. So if you wouldn't mind jumping to our wonderful art or science. So ladies and gentlemen, what the heck is this? <laughs> any ideas? Anyone in the chat have any ideas? Anyone know what it is? Dr. Lillian, do you have any idea what it might be? Um, well, I can certainly see clouds there. <laughs> it's definitely cloudy of some sort, isn't it? Some sort of, yeah. some sort of, I'm, I don't know, it looks... It looks like a, a some sort of radio survey to me, like a radio sky survey mm -hmm. to me, just the colors and I don't know, but it, yes, it, look, it looks like something really nice to weave into like a, a nice a nice shawl and then you can have a lovely colorful shawl. It does, yeah. It almost looks like bubbles as well, kind of iridescent. Oh, okay, <laughs> bubbles. Oh yes, yeah, I can see, the bubbles, I can see yeah. bubbles in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's something going on there, it's interesting. So mm. if you have an idea, you can always check it out at, um, at ICRA, on our Twitter, and you can make your guess there. We'll tell you on Friday, because I don't know what it is, and Dr. Lillian doesn't know what it is, so you have to tell us what it is, and we'll let you know on Friday when the, uh, when the, the, the imps that run our Twitter uh, page will tell us what it all actually is. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, enough of me rabbiting on, I think it's time to Dr. Lillian to wow us with the science. Cool, great. Well, thanks, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to um, talk here. So um, I thought I'd start first um, about just, just in general, kind of what astronomers do. I know when I first um, started studying astronomy, I kind of thought of an astronomer as kind of looking through telescopes and maybe nowadays looking through space telescopes like Hubble there on the right. And maybe, or maybe using something like the VLT in Chile. Or maybe if you're an Australian astronomer, using the MWA or SKA, big radio telescopes. But so far, what astronomy means kind of to me and what I do is mainly use supercomputers. So uh, like my current research uses a supercomputer called Magnus, which is at the Pawsey um, Supercomputing Center. And I use this supercomputer to perform simulations. So um, I've got a couple of examples here. I'll actually talk about all these examples during the talk. You don't really know too much about and uh, too much what they're about. But um, on the on the right, you have some kind of these clouds, these um, star forming regions. And on the left, you've got kind of a, re a whole box, a box that represents part of the universe. So these are the kinds of things that um, I do on a day to day basis. So um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about kind of the impact simulations are having on um, kind of modern day astronomy, because I know um, it's kind of an area that maybe is not traditionally kind of, you don't put with astronomers, like um, kind of these models. So I thought a good way to um, think about this is maybe go and look at the kind of publication records. Like, so um, as an astronomer, we tend to publish papers um, to do with our research and we'll want to get citations, which is where another um, researcher has cited our work or referenced our work. So um, my paper has been published in the monthly notices of Royal Astron Astronomical Society, 
or Munras. And so this year so far, 20% of articles published in Munras directly relate to astrophysical simulations. And then I looked at the two most cited papers in Munras over the last decade, and they were both to do with models and simulations. So I've got, was one the top one there? It's to do with um, uh, stars and modeling stars and how stars evolve. And the um, second one is the Eagle Project, which is a, um, an enormous simulation of tens of thousands of galaxies. And between them, they have 3,000 citations. So I think this is just to show how much of an impact simulations are having. So why is there such an interest in simulations? Um, I think one of the big draws of a simulation is the fact when we look through a telescope and we look at a uh, um, particular astrophysical um, object, sorry, <laughs> a, a particular object, um, you're seeing um, it just in that moment in time, you're seeing it one moment in time, you're looking, say, even though uh, when you look um, uh, further, the farther you look into the universe, the further back you're looking, you're still only seeing that object at that specific moment in time. So it'd be really cool to be able to, say, look at a galaxy and see what it looked like, say, a million years ago or a billion years ago, which are the kind of, um, kind of time scales that we're thinking of when we think of um, the universe, you know, 13 billion years old. You want to be able to follow how these galaxies evolved or how the stars were born, things like that. So that's the kind of draw of simulations. You can, you can start with say the initial conditions, you can start at the beginning of the universe and follow galaxy evolution or the evolution of stars from um, very early on. Cool. Okay, so um, I thought a great way to um, in, uh, introduce simulations are to talk about kind of the simulations I do and talk about kind of setting up what we do to set up a simulation. So the kind of simulations I use in my research are called smooth particle hydrodynamical simulations. So that's a kind of mouthful. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So um, on the left there, I have a, a molecular cloud. Uh, so this is Cepheus B. And this is um, kind of the stellar, this is where the stars are born. This is kind of the stellar nursery. So the majority of the stars in our galaxy are born in molecular clouds like this. So they're interesting things to study because if you know what goes on in a molecular cloud, you know how stars like our sun were born. So if you wanted to simulate this molecular cloud, you might take a region of it. And then the smooth particle hydrodynamical part is specifically interested in the gas in that cloud. So a gas in um, physical terms, we think of it as a fluid. So you can, the same equations that govern the gas in the universe, you can also th um, think of governing water flow through a pipe. So engineers use smooth particle hydrodynamics too. So it's got quite a wide range of applications. And so the clue is in the name as to what um, SPH does. So um, what you do is you model your gas as a set of discrete particles like this. So in, in actuality, um, we know that gas is actually made of particles. It's actually made of things like molecules, say like molecular hydrogen. For everyone who remembers their chemistry, <laughs> I've got a um, um, hydrogen atom um, like molecule there. So ideally, our particles would be the size of the molecules. That would be an ideal world. However, in our simulations, one particle might actually be the mass of a sun. <laughs> it might contain that much mass in it. And then in the largest simulations, um, the particle mass is over a million times that of our sun. And this is because if you want to model something like the Milky Way, the Milky Way alone has a mass of 1.5 trillion suns. So you're just talking enormous numbers. So to make it feasible, you really need to be um, having, you know, having these larger particle mass sizes. Another way of looking at this is in your molecular cloud, you, in, in two centimeters of a molecular cloud, so you could take two centimeters, you have about 10 molecules in that distance. So if you look at on the right there, we've got the Eagle Nebula which, and the Pillars of Creation. So this is a molecular cloud as where stars are forming. And if you took one of those pillars, it's sort of five light years in length. And this would mean you'd need to model 10 to the 19 molecules. This is 10 with 19 zeros. So just these numbers are just unfeasibly hard. You can never model just the molecule. Oh, and I put a coin there because that's two centimeters of apparently the Two, two Australian dolls. <laughs> so um, you can imagine there are um, some issues with this approximation. Um, and I think a good way of showing this would be to think about something simple like cooling. You might want your gas to be able to cool. Um, and so cooling in physics, we really mean 
a gas is losing energy. So um, in reality, this all happens on a kind of molecular atomic level. So an example of a cooling process, it's got lots of different ways of um, losing energy, this gas, but say this would be an example. You have two hydrogen atoms there on the right, and each hydrogen atom looks like something on the left. So I don't know, <laughs> yeah, again, this is going back to kind of, <laughs> kind of you know, chemistry, I guess. Um, so you've got your nucleus in the center and you have um, an electron orbiting it on the left. That's what the hydrogen atom looks like. An electron can be in, sits in a specific energy level. And what can happen when two hydrogen atoms collide like this, is that the electron can actually increase its energy and move to the, an, an upper energy level. So it's kind of taken that move, the energy that went into that movement or that kinetic, we call it kinetic energy, and um, bumped up the um, energy of the electron. Now, the electron can now radiate that energy it's gained away. So what's happened there is you've taken the original kinetic or move, the energy that was trapped in the movement of those atoms, and you've actually radiated it away from the gas. So in, in net effect is that you've lost energy from your gas and you've cooled. So you think that sounds simple. So if you wanted to model, say, lots of hydrogen atoms, like in the same mass as there was in the sun, maybe if we knew the number of collisions and we knew the amount of energy lost per atom, we could work out how much energy the gas loses and cools. However, uh, molecular clouds, for one thing, aren't just hydrogen. They have other molecules there. Um, you, have, you, you have some water, for example. Um, you can see on the right there, you've got helium, you've got um, carbon monoxide, you've got lots of different molecules. And all these molecules have different energy levels and different ways of losing energy. That was just one of the ways they can lose energy. Sometimes they could vibrate, they can collide and then start vibrating. And um, as an example. And so simulators, we're kind of forced to approximate what molecules we think are there, what kind of energy levels are involved, what cooling processes are going on. So back to the smooth particle hydrodynamical simulations. Um, now the other key is in the uh, is in the name, and it's the um, smoothed um, kind of property. So properties in SPH simulations are smoother the number of neighbors to represent and um, represent the fluid. And this is done with kind of a three D um, sphere called a kernel. And this kernel ensures that the particles closest to a gas particle have a bigger impact on its derived properties. I won't go into that in too much detail, but basically it just means things are smooth. And it kind of, it links to the fact this is supposed to be representing a fluid, not just like individual particles. So we have our SPH. How do we start building our simulation? So if we take, um, we've got our gas. So that's represented by SPH particles. What else might we want to put into a simulation? Um, so for one thing, we need to know how the gas should be set up. Um, so we could maybe, so when we look at the original kind of cloud, we know that there's areas where there's not a lot, lot of gas and there's areas where there's lots of gas and it's very compact. So how would we set that up in a simulation? There are a number of possibilities. So one, we could give particle um, the particles velocities and in such a way that it would lead to kind of a clumpy distribution like this. And we know, we know kind of what kind of velocities that the, um, the gas kind of has in these clouds. So we could maybe kind of approximate this. Another thing we could do is set it up that way in the first place. You know, we know, we, we know where we want the kind of dense parts. We know we want the kind of voids where there's not a lot of particles. We could do that. And whether we, however we set it up, it really depends on what we want to find out from our simulation. Do we, for example, maybe we're interested in the distribution of the gas and where the voids are. So if we were interested, we probably don't want to set it up like that originally. Um, but overall, however we set up the gas, um, it, these, this is called the initial conditions of the gas. So another thing we might want to include in our simulation are stars. So again, we can put these in just as individual particles. And so these are um, actually easier than the gas to model because they are individual objects, which means that they interact through gravity, but they don't, they're not a fluid. They don't have to follow the SPH kind of equations of motion as a, as, as a fluid would. Or alternatively, maybe we could include a star formation law. So we know um, that stars are likely to form from very cold, compact gas. So maybe we could add this as a rule in our simulation when the gas gets to a certain kind of density, we call it, or kind of compactness, we, um, 
and introduce a star particle. So another thing we might want to add is that cooling that we spoke about before, like what rules can we follow for the cooling of the gas? This is particularly important if we are looking at say molecular cloud kind of level, we want stars are gonna form from the coldest gas. We want to know which gas is able to cool. So we can follow, there are rules we can follow. And one thing is that um, the, how fast the gas cools actually depends on the temperature it's at. So astrophysical kind of um, clouds of gas can range from, have a huge range of temperatures from around 10 degrees above absolute zero to sort of millions of um, degrees centigrade. And how, um, and, and how fast a gas cools also depends on what kind of atoms, molecules, ions are there. So say your gas is um, consisting of mainly hydrogen and helium, you would follow this kind of rule. So when you're at very high temperatures, you have a relatively high cooling rate or the gas um, uh, cools um, quite fast. Um, and when you're at lower temperatures, you have two points, two temperatures at which the gas will um, cool very, very quickly. But say you had a gas um, cloud that had a similar chem chemical composition as the sun, had lots of iron in it, for example, things like this, or oxygen. It might look something more like this. So you have a really enormous kind of peak. The gas will cool very quickly, um, at kind of middling temperatures there. And, um, and it will follow the same on kind of this higher temperature, same as the hydrogen and helium gas at the higher temperatures. So really all I want to show here is that you, it does follow some rules. There are some physical laws you can put into your simulation, depending on what temperature your particles are at, you can say, and how much you've, of each chemical you think is inside that gas particle, you can, you can kind of estimate how much the gas is going to cool. So another thing we could maybe kind of recipe we could put into our um, simulations, are what the, actual, the stars actually do, do they just sit there? Are they just particles? or do they radiate? So we know our sun radiates, lots of different electromagnetic radiation, and this can affect the um, surroundings in lots of different ways. For example, when we think of our atoms again, the um, radiation can be absorbed by the electron, it can bump it up to a higher energy level, and there you've, you've um, interacted with your surroundings. We also know that um, stars emit streams of charged particles called the solar wind. The solar wind, it's a solar wind that ends, um, leads to um, Phenomena like the aurora on the right, and so that's not. And yes, this, this is again is um, impacting their surroundings. We also know that very massive stars can die in spectacular explosions called supernovae. So you've got a supernovae on the left there. You can kind of see that, uh, and a supernovae are just pointy explosions. They release enormous amounts of energy into their surroundings, and as well as dust and chemicals. So they really do have a big impact on their surrounding surroundings. But this is only stars that are eight times more massive than our sun. So overall, there's other things that stars do, but those are just a, a few. And um, overall, however stars are impacting their environment, we refer to the whole thing as stellar feedback. Stellar feedback is just um, stars impacting their environment in some way. Maybe it's energy, maybe they inject dust, maybe, maybe they do other things. So, and how you model, each of these effects um, depends on your what we call your resolution. So this is really how much mass each particle is representing. If it's say a sun, or if it's a million suns worth of gas, and you can see that if say you think about stellar winds. So the mo most massive stars are called OB stars, and they inject a, um, a lot of mass into their surroundings. They actually inject around 10 times the mass of our sun per million years into their surroundings through these stellar winds. But so if your gas particle mass was say um, one um, mass of our sun, then you could imagine you could maybe put in these stellar winds. You could say, well, that mass has gone and kind of been injected into your simulation. But say your particle mass in your simulation is a million times the mass of the sun. That means you couldn't possibly model these stellar winds as individual um, kind of particles, because your gas particle is a million, millions of times that. So instead, you can think about how the stellar winds will actually impact the surroundings. Maybe they'll heat it up. Maybe you can put that heating into your gas particles. So you kind of have to think, it really depends on what resolution you're thinking, how you model these. Another thing you could put into your simulations are black holes. So kind of on the molecular cloud level, you're really thinking stellar mass black holes. 
So some of those supernovae, um, if, the, if after the explosion, the remnant, the uh, center of the supernovae is two or three times the mass of the sun, then you can end, um, it will collapse and form a black hole. And we call this a stellar mass black hole because it's not millions of times the mass of the sun, like supermassive black holes we'll talk about in a minute. It's, you know, just a few times the mass of the sun. And sometimes these stellar mass black holes can occur in binary pairs. So this is where you've got in the image there, you've got a black hole and you've got a, another star orbiting it. And when that star is particularly massive, so say it's one of those OB stars, those really bright stars that are losing a lot through stellar winds, some of the that um the, that OB star can kind of the, the matter that's coming off that OB star can funnel into your black hole. And this kind of produces enormous amounts of energy and it, in the form of these of humongous plasma jets. So that's what you're seeing on the um, left there. You're seeing these kind of collimated jets forming either side of um, the black hole or the disk of matter surrounding it. You can also include supermassive black holes in your simulation. So these are much more massive than millions of times the mass of the sun, rather than just, you know, two or three. And um, we, um, we know they exist, for example, I think uh, maybe a few of you did see the um, event, event Horizon Telescope um, image that was published recently of the Event Horizon of Supermassive Black Holes. So we think there's one at the um, center of um, nearly every galaxy. Um, and on these, these supermassive black holes can also form these jets these plasma jets, except from these are on a much larger, grander scale, impact the, you know, galaxy wide, have galaxy wide implications. So they're important, but maybe less important in your star forming clouds, but more important if you're going to be modeling galaxies or regions of the universe. Another thing you might include if you're modeling kind of, again, kind of a larger scale kind of thing is dark matter. So a little history on this. So in 1933, Fritz Zwicky studied the motions of galaxies in the coma cluster. This is about, um, a cluster of a thousand galaxies. And what he saw was that the um, galaxies were moving impossibly quickly to still be kind of connected to this cluster. They should fly off. There was something keeping them there, just as we're kept around the sun um, through its gravitational pull. So something was pulling these um, galaxies through gravity, but he couldn't see it in the amount of the matter he could see. There wasn't enough matter. So he hypothesized the existence of a missing or dark matter, which is literally matter that could not be observed. And now, uh, and dark matter is still a mystery, whether it exists. We know there's something there that's keeping these. This is not just on a um, kind of clusters of galaxy scale. There's on a galaxy scale. There's something that means the motions of the stars are faster than they should be if you just look at the amount of visible matter. Um, so we include it in our simulations. Cool. So you have your ingredients in your simulation. You put it all together, all your different models. You can put in different physics. Um, so I've just done a few of the uh, things you could put in there. And then now you, what you can do is you can maybe tweak them. So for, so for your star forming clouds, you might be interested in your, um, the initial conditions of your gas, how, how, you know, how fast it's moving initially. You might be interested in your star formation law. You know, you might, uh, what happens when you change that? So I just ran these, just um, a few small simulations just to illustrate this. So um, on your left there, you've got, you've changed in the initial conditions of the gas. You've got you've, that, those velocities. I started with velocities, um, different velocities for the gas particles and then changed that. And you can see that has, you know, uh, so each of these um, images, I should have said, is uh, uh, our, uh, our regions of gas. So where it's redder, it means it's a more compact gas and where it's yellower, it means it's less compact. And then each black dot is a star that's been produced by this star forming cloud. Should have said that first, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so yes, on the left there, that's I've changed the initial conditions of the gas. And then you've seen that's had an impact on where the gas is, the distribution, um, also how many stars have formed. And on the right, I've changed the star formation law and that's had less of an effect than the initial conditions. And um, yeah, that can tell, tell me something too. So, when you do something like this, when you tweak the initial conditions of a simulation, it's known as a parameter study. And this can be very useful. And maybe I'll illustrate this now. So using the results of a simulation, so say you've run kind of your parameter study, what can you do with it? What does it tell you? So I think one of the really cool things that simulation can do, it can give you an indicator of the physics that's going on in these astronomical objects. Um, so I've got an example here. 
So one thing, one a mystery to do with uh, molecular clouds in these star forming regions is how long they can live when you've got say something like a supernova going off in them. Um, so yeah, how could they survive that? Or could they survive just simply the radiation from the star initially? Um, from st stars are forming, they're injecting this radiation. Would that cause the um, cloud to um, kind of explode? Would it, would it you know, disintegrate it? So maybe to answer this, um, you could run again, you could set off two clouds, you could vary, say your stellar and what stars you put in. And this, these are just two simulations of different types of stars and looking at kind of the supernovae, particularly supernova feedback. And you end up with kind of cavities. And then you can look at the observations on the left there. So this is um, a complex of molecular clouds in star forming regions in, the, in our galaxy. And the blue parts in particular are the um, supernova driven cavities in the gas, these kind of enormous kind of cavities that have been um, exploded because of supernovae and, and just energetic stars. So you can look at these and you can um, infer maybe a cloud lifetime based on your, um, um, what you observe and how long you think that these clouds were able to survive. And maybe that doesn't match what your theory suggests, your simulations. So you'd go back to the theory and then maybe you tweak, you do another parameter study or you tweak the physics going it, maybe there's something you're missing. And this can be very informative. So, um, and you can kind of, kind of follow this process. You can also mock observe simulations. So you can pretend you're looking through a telescope at your simulation and see whether it fits what you observe. And if it doesn't, why doesn't it? It, kind of, it, it, it gives you kind of an extra, um, it, it kind of tells you what's going on in, in, in that galaxy. So what else can we um, simulate? So I've just talked about one instance there. So that was, um, yeah, to very small regions of the galaxy, molecular clouds. Other things you can um, simulate are kind of larger regions of the universe. So here I've got an example where I've simulated the cosmic web. So I mentioned dark matter before. We don't think dark matter is un uniformly distributed about the universe. We think it forms this amazing kind of web and filaments, this um, filamentary structure. And this actually, this, uh, this underpins where the galaxies we see today are. So if you understand the cosmic web, you understand kind of, it, really, it helps you towards understanding galaxy formation, why our galaxy where it is where it is today. So these, um, so yes, you can um, run these enormous simulations, but looking at that, you can, I, I mentioned Eagle before, that has tens of thousands of galaxies. You can follow the evolution of tens of thousands of galaxies through cosmic time, see what they look like at the end, um, at, at, at now, and look, look what they look like, say, um, uh, kind of a billion years ago. Um, other, other things you can, sim there's a huge myriad of different simulations you can do. You can do, um, I, I, um, you can look at, say, how planets form. Um, you can look at individual supernovae explosions, um, you name it. And also, I've only mentioned SBH there. There's actually other ways of modeling gas as well. You can maybe form a grid instead, <laughs> model it that way. There's, there's a huge, there's a myriad of simulations out there. So before I finish, I thought I'd talk a little bit um, about the supercomputers that um, we run the simulations on. So, um, Supercomputers are actually, uh, yeah, first, uh, maybe I'll say what a supercomputer super is. <laughs> so supercomputers super are akin to a cluster of normal computers working together. And um, so, where, but whereas your PC might have like um, one high-end processor, for example, supercomputers have thousands of processors working in parallel. And the way we run our simulations is we want to do many, lots of different calculations in parallel using each of those processors, maximizing how um, kind of uh, the, how, how, how the efficiency of how we use them. So a little history of um, supercomputers. The um, CDC 6600 is considered to be the world's first successful supercomputer invented by Seymour Clay. And it was the um, world's in, um, fastest computer between 1964 and I've closed that 1967. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, Yes, and uh, so to give you an idea of how fast it was, um, it could perform 3 million flops. So flops are floating point operations per second. We tend to measure sim um, supercomputers in flops because you really, when you're running one of these big simulations, that's the thing you're interested in, how many calculations it can do per second. You want to maximize that number. And this is less powerful, um, less, less speedy than your average uh, iPhone. <laughs> So the 
uh, supercomputer that I, use, I, I do a lot of my work on is Pawsey's Magnus. So you've got the center there on the um, uh, left. And um, this actually has a speed of one quadrillion flops, which is one with 15 zeros on it. <laughs> so you can see the speed up <laughs> from, from just, you know, however many, what, 50 years. <laughs> so, um, and then the fastest supercomputer in the world is the Summit, which is 200 quadrillion flops. <laughs> so they are, they are amazing things, supercomputers. It's a very exciting time, I think, to be in, to, in you know, running simulations. So um, I thought I'd um, end the talk with maybe uh, just a few links. So obviously, when I do these simulations, I use computing coding languages, and that's how I started. So mainly, I use Python and C and C plus um, C plus uh, plus. But um, and um, I've put a few links here if you're interested in learning some coding. I think um, there's a few like free courses and things you can do there. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dr. Lillian. That was really exciting. So the simulation side of astronomy is really interesting and something that most people don't know a lot about. <laughs> yeah, so how, a question I want to ask then, to get to where you are, when you were studying at school, did you have to do a lot of coding at school and then, or was it something you learned later on? Um, yes, I definitely uh, learned it later on. Uh, even in my degree, I wouldn't have said I was brilliant at it. <laughs> but when I got to my, I got to the end of my degree and I did a project that was looking at dark matter and I just got really interested. So it wasn't until sort of, you know, a few years into university level that I really got interested in the kind of the coding and using supercomputer side of things. So yeah, it's definitely, if you're interested in this side of things, you definitely don't need to be coding, you know, if you're in high school, <laughs> you could just kind of be interested. But having said that, it's, you know, <laughs> you can use coding for all sorts. <laughs> Excellent. But it's really interesting. We have a couple of questions from uh, Dr. Matthew Rolls. So we're getting some serious questions here um, <laughs> about your simulations, the few simulations you just did it for us. What's the time step for your, the, between each simulation? Oh, okay. Um, so yes, that varies hugely. Frame, um, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that varies hugely depending. You might have, um, uh, so, some of my simulations, it's more on the orders of sort of thousands of years. And that's a really good question, actually, because it really depends. Obviously, um, and some of them are, and some of them are more kind of like towards the million years kind of end, depending on how big the simulation is. And it's a really good question, because if you're, say, looking at stars, some of your stars, your largest stars, only um, live for um, millions, on the order of millions of years. So if your this time step is something, you know, like similar to that, or like maybe 100 times smaller, you, you do really need to be, um, and, and you say you have a supernova go off, how do you inject that, you know, energy into your simulation? Um, yeah, so but yeah, yeah, it definitely varies between the simulations. <laughs> and another question from, um, from Matthew Rolls, any love for Fortran? <laughs> um, yeah, I have used Fortran a bit, yeah. <laughs> My supervisor, Chris Power, uses a bit more Fortran than I do. <laughs> um, but, um, so yeah. <laughs> Here's a question for me then. How do you model something we don't know anything about yet? Well, not much, as in dark matter. So we don't know what dark matter is, but we model it. So how do we know we're actually modeling the correct thing if we don't know what it is yet? So will we, so I guess, um, yeah, it's a really good question. So um, I guess the reason, say, I would use it in my simulations is because we know something's there. We know something is holding, if um, dark matter wasn't there, the stars would be flying off. <laughs> They'd have two higher speeds, they wouldn't be bound to the galaxy. So we need something gravitationally there. Um, as to, but um, so, but the nature of dark matter is something that say other simulations might be interested, they might change how say it interacts with normal matter and they might tweak that and see what differences that would um, create. If, if, and um, one thing you can do is, um, start maybe at the beginning of the universe, change kind of the nature of dark matter, follow it through the um, and see what differences there are, whether we get the same sort of galaxies. And then to, um, that's the great thing about simulations, you can kind of see something that's obviously wrong, say. <laughs> but, but often what, um, what's more confusing is when you get a few different solutions to the right answer. <laughs> you get galaxies that look kind of normal. They, uh, you know, they have the right kind of mass of stars, say, for, their, um, for how massive they are in total. And then you have to, um, as it gets more, could be more, you have to more, some more subtle effects. <laughs> so we finish up there. If there's any people, any more questions, feel free to ask them. But if you're too shy to ask, you can always contact us at ICRA and we'll pass on your questions to Dr. Lillian to answer in the future as well. 
Um, well, actually, here's one. Here's a question. Uh, what's the largest volume of space you've ever simulated? Simulated, sorry. So I haven't done two big ones. I've done um, 50 megaparsecs, <laughs> which, which uh, so a, a, a megaparsec. So a parsec is 10 with uh, times with 16 zeros meters. <laughs> so um, it'd be uh, a million and then, yeah, <laughs> 50 times a million times that. <laughs> so he, he, quite big, big. <laughs> Very large. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to finish up there once again thank you very much to dr lillian for coming and telling about simulations if you, want to, if you have any questions make sure you ask us and we'll see you next week for another astronomy wednesday cool thank you